Hello everyone, welcome to the Gold Coast Church of Christ. It's been such a great week for God. You know, I finally returned home after three weeks of being stuck in isolation in Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, the campus, we've been evangelizing on campus for O-Week and, uh, you know, that's been very fruitful and I'm just, you know, pray about that and hopefully that goes well. Uh, and more importantly, the Maroons won State of Origin! You know, I think Rob ran away just for that reason. He went down to Sydney because he doesn't want it to be robbed in. But So, <laughs> could everyone please turn to 1 Corinthians 9 and we'll be reading from verses 24 to 27. <coughs> um, so the, the scripture reads, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will, that, that will not last, but we do not get a crown that will, not, that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a, body, a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. So um, a bit of context, here Paul is addressing the uh, church in Corinth, which uh, was plagued with disunity and lowered standards. Uh, to simplify, uh, Paul is basically charging the church to practice higher standards and self-discipline so that they may be fruitful within the mission and their walks with God. Um, <clears throat> to that end, relating to the sporting scripture, I can think of no better example than State of Origin. Uh, the Maroons trained hard, constantly denying themselves um, sacrificing their time and energy on the field while the Blues were wasting their time probably at Maccas, you know. But more importantly, the Maroons, they trained, they disciplined themselves, and they won that crown. They won State of Origin 2022. There could only be one winner, and their labour paid off. We are tasked with constantly seeking God. In Matthew 13, the kingdom of heaven is compared to a treasure hidden in the field. It takes, some time, it takes some real dedication to seek that treasure, doesn't it? You can't expect to bang your toe on a, a, on a treasure chest just in the middle of the road. You've got to like, go out of your way to search for it. You've got to make that effort. You've got to search. You've got to seek. You've got to put your heart out and actually go out of your way to find it. Uh, we are tasked with seeking God wherever we trek, following his precepts and grace. But to do so, we need the ability to deny ourselves and have the discipline to open our hearts and listen to what, is, what Jesus has intent, instructed us to do. We need to train ourselves to be one with God through the word. Very few manage to find the, find the gates of heaven, but when we do, we're refined like silver. We win a race that gives us everything we need. If we wish to find victory within God, we have to run this race with the intention of winning, which involves training, avoiding things that take away from God and listening. For all the guests in the room, you made a great sacrifice in coming here today. I'm encouraged that you decided to dedicate your time to listening to God's word, rather than wasting away at Macca's or getting invested in like worldly things and you know focusing strictly on what you know god and making that time to remember jesus and the sacrifice he made for us uh, I'm uh, i'd like to welcome you all for coming here today and i'd like to welcome everyone this morning with the charge to continually seek god wherever you go to continue running the race fighting like a boxer trying to score blows or like or more importantly like maroon scoring on a wednesday night I encourage everyone to open their hearts to the sermon this morning and to continue in God's glorious kingdom, to continue seeking, to listen to the word, and to continue, more importantly, to remember Jesus and his, the sacrifice he made for us. And with that, I'd like to pray. Uh, dear God, thank you so much for bringing us all together this morning. Thank you for, um, you know, giving us the opportunity to be saved for our sins and to remember the grace that you've, been, that you've gifted us. You know, we, we often forget in our, especially me, I forget in my moments of of turmoil, the sacrifice, and just how great it was. Um, uh, but more importantly, I'm just so grateful that you can bring us here together and to remember the sacrifice and, and to just remember your laws and precepts. You know, I sing, great, I sing praise to it every, every morning and I pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, everybody, please stand as we sing Prince of Peace, you are holy, same kind of thing. <laughs> Thank you. 
Amen, brothers and sisters. It is awesome to be here this morning. It is a little bit chilly, though. My fingers, they feel a bit cold. Um, if you don't know me, my name's Phil, and it's my beautiful wife, Tanika. Um, and right now is a time of communion where we get to really slow down our hearts, slow down our minds, and think about the cross, think about what Jesus has done in our lives and how he has transformed our lives. If you don't know where communion uh, originated from, it was at the Last Supper, where Jesus took bread and he broke it and he took wine and, and, and he looked out at his apostles and he said, do this in remembrance of me. You know, take this bread, take this wine and, and remember me uh, in these moments. And the call is to do it throughout our entire lives, not just uh, on a Sunday, but really throughout our entire lives. Uh, after, after we finish praying here, uh, you'll see some uh, wine and some um, grape juice come around and some bread. Feel free to take some and, uh, yeah, to really reflect on the cross. There'll be wine on the outside and grape juice in the middle. And then, brothers and sisters, if you have a Bible, let's turn together to Matthew chapter 11. And we'll read a short passage from there. Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 28, this is Jesus speaking, and he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, I, I was thinking... I was looking at the news and I was thinking about the state of the world, right? The state of the world right now. You look at the news and, and you know, you, see, you get this sense of, man, the world is just like this wild place, right? And through all of our time, through all of humanity's time, the world has been a wild place. But, man, right now, the news, that it just looks so grim, right? There's assassinations, there, there's, you know, there's viruses, there's wars, and as I look at all this, I can really see this way down my life. It weighs on me, right? You look at the news and you just feel, man, this is heavy. Where's the world really heading, right? Where's the world really heading? And I think, you know, that can really bring us down the state of the world. But I think also in our lives, our own lives and our own sin and our own burdens and the struggles of life can also weigh us down. They can bring us down. So not only does the world drag us down and everything that's happening out there, sometimes even our internal world and the sins and our distance from God and just the challenges of life can also weigh us down. You know, our, our sinful desires try to pull us further away from, from who God really intended and designed us to be. And for this audience here to whom Jesus is speaking to, they were also being weighed down by the religious rulers of their times. You know, putting all these rules and these heavy burdens on them that didn't really uh, emphasize the heart behind why are we really doing this? What's really at the root of this? And so they were weighed down by many things. All of a sudden, you start to see that, man, life can get quite heavy, right? Life can get quite heavy. At this point, at the point where Jesus has, uh, was saying this, this is halfway through Matthew, uh, and, and, you know, he hasn't gone to the cross yet. Jesus hasn't been to the cross yet. He knows it's coming up, he knows it's ahead, but he hasn't been to the cross just yet. But already Jesus can see the significance that his victory over sin on the cross will have in our lives. He can see this is going to be of a tremendous impact in all your lives. Um, and I think for us in this room, this passage is really a great reminder of how our relationship with Jesus really nullifies the burdens of the world, right? All the weight, all that pressure, everything that we feel, the grind of the day to day, man, Jesus flat out nullifies that and allows us to be free, to be light, to live life to the full, to live it with great and immense joy. And I think it's one thing to really read this verse and to admire it and go, man, this is a cool verse. This is a wise verse. I admire this verse. But it's a completely different thing to personally experience this scripture in your life. 
to really live out and see the scripture come to fruition in your life, to see the full pressures of life and feel the damage of our sin and then watch all those things completely evaporate when we bring them before the cross, when we bring them before Jesus. You know, we, we see great peace and rest come to a place in our lives where before we could not see any peace and rest and the challenges that in our lives that seem so huge. How can I ever deal with this? How can I figure this out? All of a sudden, those challenges shrink away as we bring them before God, for He is so much bigger. You know, I think about a passage in Philippians chapter 4 where it talks about, man, there is a peace that transcends understanding. Right? There is a peace that comes with God that no human can even explain. But if you've been there, then you've been there. And it starts with us bringing everything before the cross. I'm going to get Tanika to share a little bit more. The time of communion is definitely one where we get to reflect on the cross and on the sacrifice Jesus made for us. Communion leads us to reflect on how much Jesus has done in our lives and how much his sacrifice has changed our lives. When I think about how much his sacrifice has changed my life, I can't help but be grateful. I was so lost and broken and didn't know who I was. I seeked after boys' attention, uh, people's acceptance and approval, did what I could to numb out the world and the pain and burdens that came with life. But then when I actually knew who God was and, and knew who, who I was in God also, communion became a time to see how grateful I am to be able to be given this chance to know God and how Jesus dying on that cross meant that I could be free from the clutches of sin and all the sinful ways that I was entangled in. But it's not the only time we get to reflect on God. We can use our daily times with God uh, to also reflect on Jesus and the sacrifices that he made. When looking at this scripture, I'm reminded that going to God in our, in our well, when our world is crazy, is definitely important because as he promises, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. As you can tell, we have a baby due in eight short weeks. And you may not have been able to tell. It's all right, guys. It's all right. Um, but... This, this pregnancy has not been easy. It's been quite full of anxiety and stress and fear. Um, and I've spent a lot of this pregnancy in a weird place where I, turning to God, I knew that was what I needed to do, but I just didn't know how to do it. I didn't know what to do. I felt so overwhelmed by everything that was going on. The burdens of the anxiety compiled with work, marriage, my husband, which, love him, but, you know, and... Um, <laughs> family, which we all know that's pretty hard to, and then just friendships in general, meant that I needed God more than ever before. However, I did not know how to turn to him in the way I needed it to, needed it to happen. After talking, t talking it through with some close friends, I realized that going to God was the only thing that would truly help me. Starting my day with reading and praying, reflecting on the, the actions of God and Jesus, especially the sacrifice on the cross, has truly helped me to not only feel a weight lifted from my shoulders, but also have a complete rest in God. I encourage you today that if you're feeling overwhelmed with life, whatever it may be, that you use this time in communion to remember Jesus and the sacrifices he made and lean on God and Jesus because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Thank you. Thanks, Tanika. Amen, brothers and sisters, as we reflect on the cross this morning, let's really choose to take up Jesus' yoke and let go of all the burdens of the world, surrendering to him. Amen. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Uh, mighty God, Lord, we are just so grateful uh, to have you at the center of our lives, Lord. We're also so grateful for one another that we have this beautiful family uh, that we can come here together and really support one another and, and re, uh, push us back in, uh, one another back to you, Lord. We really pray that, uh, you know, as we take the bread and wine today, we can reflect on you and remember that your yoke is easy, it's light. Let us let go of the world and refocus on you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
now is the time of the service where we take uh, a collection that goes towards the uh, running of the church. Uh, if you don't, if you didn't know, the entire uh, this entire church really operates based on the giving of, of the members. Um, you know, the the entire venue, all the equipment, everything is completely uh, just the church. Uh, yeah, just giving and wanting to see the kingdom grow and wanting to see more people come to know Christ. Uh, most of our members give uh, electronically. I'm not sure if there's a slide there. There it is there. If, you, if you're interested in going online and giving electronically, or there'll be uh, a bag passed around, uh, which yeah, you can give um, yeah, physical money. I almost forgot what physical money is. I like, do, like, does anyone even carry that stuff? But, but it's there. It exists. You know, that's how they did it back in Jesus' day. Silver coins and stuff, man. They used to, you know, yeah, whatever. Okay, amen. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Uh, mighty God, thank you so much that we live in such a blessed country. Uh, I really pray, mighty God, that we can, we can use these blessings and all the great things that you have given us to, to help uh, others in need and also to help uh, the church grow and expand, that we can hire more ministry staff, Lord, that we can get a bigger venue in a greater uh, location, Lord, that we can see your place, uh, your word ministered to the whole world, mighty God. I really pray you stir our hearts to really be generous with everything you have given us, mighty God. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand. Being with you guys this morning. Um, if you guys want to be opening up to Matthew chapter 21, uh, we're going to be continuing through our Matthew series. 
Um, and while you guys are doing that, just a couple of announcements. Uh, there's not, not too much is happening this week. Uh, just a quick reminder, we've got sport on uh, down at the park after church. Rob, Rob's not here today, and surely after the Origin win, we can get a game of touch going, right? Yeah? Awesome. Uh, also, just a reminder, uh, this week is going to be midweek. Uh, not Bible Talk, so that's going to be here starting at 7.15, um, just to give the people before us an opportunity to head out as well. Um, and then the big announcement for the pros. we got pros retreat coming up in September. If you guys, uh, that's from September 16th to the 18th in Adelaide. Um, if you guys have not registered for that and paid, be sorting that out. Also be sorting out accommodation. Um, I didn't realize I had to do that, but getting a hotel, finding some guys to partner up with as well. Um, awesome. So those, that's all the announcements. We're going to be starting in Matthew chapter 21. Um, and we're basically, we're going to be picking up where we left off last week and we start off with a change of scene. Okay, and so from this point onwards, we're going to be picking up with what is called the Passion Narrative. Right? And so ever since chapter 20 in verse 17, we see that Jesus has started making his way to Jerusalem. Um, he's traveled down through Jericho, and today in the passage, he will travel through Bethphage on finally arriving in Jerusalem. And so the Passion Narrative is basically what we describe as Jesus' crucifixion and all of the events leading up to that. And here in this passage, we start off with what is called the triumphal entry. And this is where Jesus basically stages this gigantic royal entry where he comes to Jerusalem as the king. And as you read through, we're going to read the passage in a little bit, but as you, you read through, the scene just comes across as, as backwards and confusing and just really weird for a couple of reasons. Right? Firstly, because for a king coming in on a donkey with some old cloaks followed by a bunch of peasants, doesn't exactly bring the image of royalty to mind. Secondly, because after this grand entrance from Jesus into Jerusalem, you find the crowds still don't know who he is. Right? They're not exactly bowing down to him and worshipping him as their king. And lastly, because his very first act as king, when he arrives, is he goes into the temple, and instead of bringing everyone in to celebrate, he chases everyone out. And so, you know, as confusing as it is, the passage ultimately shows us that Jesus' reign is completely different from what we would expect from an earthly king. And if we want to be on board with him as our king, we need to take some time to learn from him about what the kingdom looks like. So we're going to read the passage. Before that, we're going to pray, and then we'll get a couple of points out of it. So if you guys all want to bow with me in a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you this morning, I'm so grateful for another week where we get to come together um, and worship you as a congregation, Lord, uh, to sing your name, uh, to be convicted by your word, and also enjoy our great fellowship. I want to thank you, Lord, for all of the speakers that they came up. You could speak powerfully through them as well, Lord. Um, and I just want to thank you for your Bible that we get to read it here, uh, learn about you and what you've done, Lord, and go out and apply it in our lives as well. I want to thank you for the congregation. I want to pray for them and pray for myself that we can all have soft, open hearts to your word, Lord, and a desire to actually go out and change our lives as a result of what we hear. Thank you so much for everything that you've given us, Lord, all of the blessings you've provided and everything that you've got to give us for the future. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so starting in chapter 21 in verse 1, it reads, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king uh, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds then went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. 
Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out, uh, went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. And so I've got a few ideas from the text about what we can learn uh, from Jesus, about his idea of the kingdom and how we can apply it into our lives as well. And the first thing that we need to understand is that Jesus is not trying to impress the world. And so as the passage opens up, it opens with Jesus sending two disciples ahead of him to prepare his royal procession. And he says to them in verse 2, it says, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. This is the first thing that he does to prepare his royal procession, and it's all he does to actually prepare. In verse 7 and 8, it says that later the crowds come, they lay their cloaks on the donkeys on the ground, and other people cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And this is kind of a depiction of what it would have actually looked like. But as you read the passage, you kind of think to yourselves, what kind of a royal procession is that? Like, all in all, this is a pretty underwhelming ceremony. And, you know, we're underwhelmed by it, but I think even for the time period, it would have been an even stranger thing to witness. Because if you guys didn't know, the Roman Empire was all about the theatrics. Appearance to them mattered so much, and any opportunity to show off how great they were was never missed. And so, in actuality, Jesus' triumphal return very closely matches this thing called, uh, very closely matches a war celebration that the Romans held, which was called the Roman Triumph. And this was a ceremony that took place after a victory in battle. And what would happen, this is what it looks like, what would happen is the general would parade around the city and the region, sometimes for days, traveling all over, just celebrating what they had accomplished. And the procession would begin with all of the prisoners of war marching through the city in chains, and followed by them would be all of the stuff that the Romans had plundered, the gold and the silver, the paintings, the weapons, the statues, everything that they accumulated. And after all of the treasure, would come the Roman senators. And these guys would be marching on foot in special war robes. After them, you kind of see what? on the right-hand side, I think, after them would come the general. And this guy would be coming and standing on a chariot, and he would be being pulled by four war horses. And as they went and traveled along, the crowds would be throwing flowers on the path and shouting praises of joy. And this celebration could last days at a time just celebrating what they had done, what they had accomplished, making a huge deal out of it. And so in comparison to these guys, Jesus' entry is kind of a joke. And you would think that if Jesus is coming in with this idea, and if he wanted the world to believe that he was king, the easiest thing for him to do would be do what the world does. Right? Throw the biggest ceremony that he could prepare. Pull out all the stops, the gold, the silver, get some horses, bring some angels in, and show them that he is more glorious, that, uh, more glorious of a king than anyone else in history. But what you actually see is that Jesus is not interested at all in impressing the world or proving that he is greater than them. In fact, I think he probably wouldn't have thrown a ceremony at all except for the fact that God told him to. In verse 4, it says, He prepared the procession the way that he did to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Yeah. And then Matthew goes on and quotes Zechariah 9.9. And so what you actually find, the whole point of this royal ceremony, is that Jesus is more concerned about fulfilling God's word. And as he does this, if the world wants to follow him, they can follow. And if some of them laugh at him along the way for a week's celebration... More power to them. Jesus is not interested. And I think for us, this is an insecurity. Oh yeah, there's the passage. 
you know, I, this is an, an insecurity that probably most of us have dealt with at some point, right? Or we're still trying to figure out now. Because obviously we're all trying to live our lives as disciples, but most of our lives are spent at work or at school or at uni, surrounded by non-disciples. And there can be a fear with living like a disciple around these people, right? Speaking the truth to them in love and standing up for our convictions, asking harder questions about their lives, speaking up when things are going wrong, or even just loving these people as a neighbor. It can be hard to act like a disciple when we're around the world. And for me, you know, I'm graduated, I'm finished uni, and I'm working for the ministry now. I spend every day on campus. I'm, I'm there more than the uni students, actually. <laughs> and I spend a bunch of my time going around sharing my faith. And, you know, as you go around talking to people, one of the questions people always ask is, what do you study? Right? It's, it's the first question that like 90% of uni students ask each other, because, you know, what else do you ask a uni student? Not much, apparently. You know, when, when people ask me, it, you know, people ask me what I study, if I'm sharing with someone else, it usually goes something like, oh, you know, this guy, he studies this and that. Uh, I actually just graduated last year. They go, oh, sweet. What did you study? I say, you know, I studied accounting and business management. I studied that for four years and I graduated last October. And they go, oh, cool. How's the job hunt going? I go, yeah, yeah. So after I graduated, I actually didn't, didn't pursue a career in accounting. I started working for my church. And, and they go, oh, so you do the finances for your church? <laughs> yeah. Nah, I do like preaching and stuff like that. <laughs> and, and then we kind of, you know, move on. But it's a weird conversation that I got to have a lot. And sometimes it's super easy to get insecure about this. And instead of, you know, when they ask this, instead of going, yeah, I'm working for my church, doing my best to grow a church, it becomes, you know, yeah, I was offered a job working for the church. I'm doing my best and I'll see how it goes. Accounting's still kind of on the table, though. I'm still not sure which, which direction I'm going to go in. Yeah, and I, I downplay the thing that I, I want to do, trying to be accepted by the world. And I think even for all of us, this can look like so many different things in our lives. I think we can downplay the body to other people. Like when a co-worker invites us, you know, somewhere on a Wednesday or a Friday night. You say, you know, do you want to come out for drinks after work? And we go, yeah, I'd love to, but I've already got plans. You know, me and my mates already have something else organized. Well, you know, we do. We've got Devo. But, you know, instead of saying, you know, we've got a Friday night Devo. Do you guys want to come along? It becomes, oh just doing something with my mates. I think with outreach as well, I think we don't want to share our faith with friends and co-workers because oh, if, I, if I invite them now, it would be a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, you know, if they, if they came to a Sunday service first, it would be weird. We've got to organize something fun for them to come to first so that the church can appeal to them. And in our minds, simply living as a disciple in the world becomes this huge struggle over somehow trying to make our discipleship compatible or even appealing to the world as well. When in reality, based on the text, we, we get totally concerned with the wrong things. And all we should be worried about is staying on track with what God has planned for our life. And the craziest part of all this is that when we live like this, we aren't going to, you know, we're not going to bring out crowds of people to the church or anything like that. But just like you see Jesus do in this passage, we do draw in people who are sincere and want to actually faithfully serve God. It, it, it's not about making church appealing to the world. It's about being a disciple. And if anyone wants to come along as well, that's great. I think secondly, if we want to be learning from Jesus, we need to be living, not just learning. And so as Jesus is making his way into the city on these two donkeys, it says that the crowds that went ahead of him were praising and shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. And you read this, and it's refreshing. You think to yourself, finally, people are starting to understand who Jesus is. Right? The son of David is the messianic title, and by giving it to Jesus, these people are starting to realize that he is the Messiah. And word spreads from this all the way into the city that Jesus is arriving. And so when Jesus arrives, the people from the city are asking, who is this? 
right? Uh, and the crowd that has amassed in Jerusalem, which is probably not the crowd that was traveling with Jesus, but a group in Jerusalem, they say, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And at this point, like, you can't help but groan. Like, we're getting to the end of the gospel. Jesus is nearing the cross. There's like seven pages left. At some point, these guys have got to get it. They're still calling him a prophet. But what's interesting is that these people, they give a bunch of facts about Jesus. It says that they know his name, they know that he is from Nazareth in Galilee, and they know that he is a prophet. And these things are all rumors that would have spread throughout the region through word of mouth well before Jesus arrived. And we know from very early on in his, gospel, or in his mission that people mistook him simply for a prophet. And then this message was spread all over. And so these people that are answering the question, they're relying on the facts that they have heard about Jesus, but you can tell based on the way that they're talking, they've never actually met him. Because once you do, you realize very quickly that Jesus is way more than just a prophet. And as I was reading this passage, I think these people, first of all, reminded me a lot of myself. But I think in general, it reminded me a lot of people that tend to know a lot about Jesus or know a lot about the Bible, but don't actually do a whole lot of living it out. Like these guys were not walking around the region with him watching Jesus perform miracles. And because they rely only on the things that they know without having any actual experience, they kind of miss the point entirely. And I think the best example that I can think of with this is traveling. You know, even those volunteer programs uh, that people can sign up to to go to other places around the world um, and help people, right? We've got the Hope Volunteer Corps. Uh, shout out to them. That was plugged at Campus Retreat. Um, but, you know, this is a thing that we do every year in the church where you can travel to countries that are less fortunate than us and sacrifice and give your time. And I haven't been on one of those before, but in middle school, I actually went to Fiji with my school to help out an AIDS orphanage over there. And it's the only time that I've ever been out of the country, so it was a, probably a more memorable experience for me. Um, but we went over there for 10 days. Uh, it was my school and it was two sister schools uh, from the same town. Uh, and we went over and we did things like fixing up their garden, painting their house, uh, you know, because it burned down. Uh, we helped the school a little bit. Um, and one thing that we did is we got partnered up with one of the kids over there from the orphanage. And so this is actually a photo of me in middle school. <laughs> Haven't changed at all. <laughs> so the, the dude on the right is my classmate, but the, the kid in the middle, his name's Rocco. He was three years old at the time. Um, and it was basically our job to take care of them, uh, have fun with them, uh, and kind of help out the women who ran the orphanage to take care of them as well. And so when, when these sorts of like trips, I like take it off the, it's all, <laughs> you know, with, with these sorts of trips, when you hear about them, you normally hear the same things, right? People say that you get to go over, you get an opportunity to serve and give to the less fortunate and sacrifice your time. And you'll feel really good about yourself because you're giving to other people instead of taking. You know, you step out of your comfort zone, you work hard, you do something really selfless. Like, all of this stuff is true, but when you actually go on these trips, none of that stuff is the things that you actually remember. For me, the most memorable part of going to Fiji was going to Macca's. That's, we're at, we're at Macca's there, in this photo. Um, I don't know if it's different now, but when we went, went over there, there was only one McDonald's on the entire island. And that was like right near the airport, right? And so the kids at the orphanage, they don't have a lot of money. And so they could only go to Macca's once a year, which is when our school would come over. And so for them, actually making this trip was one of the most special experiences for them. Traveling on the bus, they're all super excited. They're getting right into it. Um, and then when you arrive, you, get to, you shout them food and they're having fun and you get to play on the equipment and all that kind of stuff. And as we went, they were all super happy and excited. And because it was their favorite part, it was our favorite part as well. 
But what you see is that all of the things that you're told about the trip, yeah, they're true, but what actually leaves a lasting impact on us is actually going out and experiencing these things for ourselves. And I think it's important for us to remember uh, spiritually to not just be reading and understanding the word, but actually going out and doing it as well. In Luke 11, verse 28, it says, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. And I think a couple of ideas from this, how often do you actually go away and do your best to live out the practicals that are given in sermons, right? Or after a quiet time, what do you actually do to make sure you're living out what you read during the day? You know, sure, the Bible is a great spiritual guide, but the book is also extremely practical. And I think living out the Word will always give us a clearer idea of what Jesus meant by His teachings than simply reading it. And in actuality, those are the things that leave a lasting impact on our hearts, as well as the people we see in our lives as well. And so moving on, lastly, to my last point, is we need to understand that Jesus' temple is chaotic. And so now we see Jesus has traveled from Bethphage to Jerusalem. He's come into Jerusalem as king in a way that seems, you know, super laughable to the audience. He's been totally misunderstood by everyone there. He's not exactly off to the best start. His ceremony is underwhelming. People don't even know that he's the king. That doesn't stop Jesus, right? He carries on. And the very first thing that he does as king is he goes into the temple and he chases everyone out. And we see after he does this, there are four things about the temple that change. Firstly, oh, it's backwards, right? Firstly, we see that Jesus states that the temple will become a house of prayer. Secondly, we see the blind and the lame come up to him to be healed. We read that wonderful things are being done in the temple. And lastly, we see children are shouting songs of praise. And so here we actually see the kind of temple that Jesus has envisioned for his reign. A prayer-filled building that is full of joy and God's power. It's not the most organized temple by any means, and he had to do a lot of fighting to get it, to be, to get it the way it was. But you get the sense that at the end, Jesus seems to be very happy with the temple once he's finished. And when you think about it, this is what the church should look like as well. But if you keep reading in the passage, you see all of the things that Jesus seems that Jesus thinks are good, the religious leaders find to be very bad about the temple. It says in verse 15, they saw the wonderful things that he did. He saw the children shouting and they were indignant. Like how absurd is that? Wonderful things in the Bible literally translates to miracles. And they see children screaming out joyfully and like, I don't want any of that at all. Like what? And you know, obviously the religious leaders are not just a bunch of old dudes that hate fun. Right? We know that these people were some of the most... but they've got a nice structure for how things run, right? It provides a little bit of money, uh, you know, the, the unclean are out of the temple, there's no noise, no screaming, and there's a system that makes the whole sacrifice process easier, right? Like that's an old thing, they've kind of developed a little bit, but they still got to do this thing, all right, let's get a structure going. But in trying so hard to maintain this structure, they've actually gotten rid of the whole purpose of the temple to begin with. And that purpose was to create an environment where people could come and have a real connection to God. And many of the leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, they, they did this with their law as well from the Hebrew scriptures. Right? In Jewish tradition, 
Uh, they teach that God gave Moses, or that when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, he gave them the entire Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and he also gave them the Mishnah, which is the oral law that everyone needed to follow as well. And so in order to protect these laws over time, rabbis would write them down and they would add their own commentary and interpretation. And so as time went on, more rabbis thought that their opinions were really important. The size of the commentary grew to the point where there were now a bunch of rules added to the law that needed to be followed. And they put this giant fence up around the law, right? And at some point, those rules became the things that you weren't allowed to break. Because if you broke them, you came too close to breaking the law. And you can see that, most, that so many of them didn't have bad hearts about this, but because they focused so heavily on creating a structure so that anyone could follow it without breaking the law, they forgot the whole point of why the law was given in the first place. To make people aware of their sin and to turn back to God and have a real relationship with Him as a result. And because of this, the result is that a heap of people from that time period forgot that the relationship is the most important part of the Bible. And I think for us today, we need to remember what Jesus wanted for the church today. A house full of prayer, full of wonderful things, and lots of joy. Which isn't to say that structure is bad, right? It helps, the, in a lot of ways, it helps the service run properly. But that structure should reflect the expectations that Jesus had for us, right? A welcome or a communion led by prayer is powerful, in our own lives as well, I think the difference between a prayerful congregation and one that neglects this is night and day. Or with our fellowship as well. You know, I think when we finish the, the service and we decide that, okay, 12 o'clock church is done, it's time to head home. Right? Everyone else heads off to the park for the afternoon to have a great time of fellowship and we miss out on an opportunity to be joyful with one another because church is finished, it's time to go back to my life. You know, but I think church is an opportunity for all of us to come together and enjoy our relationship with God together. And the structure in our lives, our schedules and the rules uh, we try to follow, they shouldn't be getting in the way of that. Because as much as Jesus was, I'm sure he was looking forward to an organized church, he wasn't trying to create an institution. He wanted a prayer-filled building for, full of joy and miracles. That is Jesus, what Jesus wanted for his temple, and that is what we should want for the church as well. And so just to finish up, you know, uh, finishing up Jesus' triumphal return, he finally arrived in Jerusalem. He had a very strange ceremony, but I think there's a lot to learn about what his reign will look like in the future, and also from what he wants his kingdom to look like as well. I'm going to finish up now. I'm going to pray to finish up. We'll have one more song and then we can enjoy some fellowships. If you guys want to bow with me in a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, as, you know, as we finish the service today and head into fellowship, I just want to thank you once again, Lord, for this amazing opportunity for all of us to come together to worship together on a Sunday, Lord. Thank you for your word that we can enjoy it and read it uh, to challenge ourselves and apply it to our hearts as well. You know, I just want to pray, thank you for the book of Matthew, that we can take the lesson today uh, from all of the speakers, take the scriptures, apply them to our hearts, and go on to live them out in this week as well, Lord. I just want to pray for this room, that we can continue to be joyful and prayerful, Lord, and stay centered on what you want for our lives as well. Yeah. Above all else, staying close to you and having a strong relationship, Lord. Thank you for everything you've done, your blessings for the future, and everything that you've promised us, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand. We'll sing one final song. There is beyond the azure blue A God concealed from human sight He's in